Well, happy Saturday, free people of the Rocky Mountain region. This is Brandon from freestatecolorado.com with your weekly news roundup for July 8th, 2023. Every week, we take a look at some headlines, news stories, and articles from across our great state to provide you some valuable information that you can use, whether you're a liberty activist, maybe somebody running for office, or just an informed citizen who wants to keep up to date on some of the latest news. Let's take a look. First article I'd like to talk about is from the denverpest.com. Psychedelic regulations, Miranda rights, car theft penalties are among new Colorado laws taking effect July 1st. This was from July 1st, 2023. 13 newly signed laws will take effect Saturday, bringing with them new regulations around the use of psychedelics, tighter criminal penalties for auto thefts, and a codification of Miranda rights in Colorado state law. The state legislature, which finished its work for the year in early May, passed 484 bills, forwarding them to Jared Polis's desk. He vetoed 10, personal record, and allowed 11th regarding state employee insurance premiums to pass into law without his signature. Some new laws took effect immediately, but July 1st is a typical start day by which new statutes begin to kick in. Saturday is also the start of the state's new fiscal year, meaning the legislature's new $38.5 billion budget will become effective then too. Other new laws govern criminal sentencing, a new felony for pointing a laser at an aircraft, and exempting small businesses out of retail delivery fees. So here's an example, a very small slice of some of these new laws that the legislature passed. I don't know about you, but 484 bills is a lot. I mean, it's absolutely insane that our state legislature thinks that it should be passing so many bills into law. I mean, come on absolutely ridiculous for the people to really understand the scope and scale of what our state government is doing. Miranda writes, this is House Bill 231155, codifies Miranda rights, the quote, you have the right to remain silent, advisement that law enforcement reads before interrogating someone into state law. The United States Supreme Court undercut Miranda rights last year when it ruled that police couldn't be sued for not reading someone their rights. Colorado lawmakers said they wanted to ensure the Miranda requirements were enshrined in state statute. Well, that's a good thing. A psychedelic bill here, Senate Bill 23290, put certain guardrails and details around what was passed in November of 2022, Proposition 122, uh, decriminalizing some psychedelics and creating a framework for an eventual legal system. The bill limits the size a personal mushroom grows, clarifies what's legal in terms of selling and sharing homegrown product. It also shifts regulatory authority for legalized healing centers to a different agency within state government and bars local governments, some of which wanted more control over psychedelics in their areas, from stepping in. Auto thefts. Auto thefts are absolutely crazy here in Colorado, as you know. So previously, it was a law um, where it was a felony for an auto uh, theft for a car, if the car was over worth, oh, worth over $2,000, however, misdemeanor for being less. So Senate Bill 23097, um, it equalizes that. Any car that's stolen is now a felony, regardless of its value. Delivery fees, this was a good one. Unfortunately, it didn't go far enough. Senate Bill 23143 exempts small businesses. Those with annual retail sales of $500,000 or less from the state's 27 cent delivery fee. According to a state fiscal analysis of the bill, fees were paid on 161.2 million deliveries between July and December 2022, of which 2.5 million would have been exempt had this law been in place then. So that's just some highlights of some of these bills that have passed. Let's move on. This is from John Caldera from the Independence Institute on coloradopolitics.com. Legislature lies on the ballot again, July 2nd, 2023. There are two old axioms that perfectly fit the property tax ripoff going on right now in Colorado. First, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. That's because voters got conned into repealing the Gallagher Amendment two years ago, realizing only now our property taxes are going through the roof because of it. If they vote for Proposition HH this fall, we'll lose our Tabor refunds forever. Yes, forever. And then, shame on me. We'll be fooled again. Which brings us to the second old bromide, quote, history is written by the victors. Although in Colorado, the platitude is modified to ballot victories are written by lying legislators. This takes a moment to explain, but it's well worth the ride. When you get your ballot every fall, the questions on it are called ballot titles. 
When citizens petition to bring something to the ballot, as Caldera has done several times, we write up a proposed change to law, just like a legislator rewrites a bill. The bill is way too long for the whole thing to go on the ballot, so voters get a summary of the ballot title. Citizens, like Caldera, by law must bring the bill to a well-intentioned but very bureaucratic committee called the Title Board, who come up with what you read on the ballot, the title. Their mission is to write a title so it explains to voters what the bill they're voting on really does without that title campaigning for or against the measure. Now, here's where the fun is. By contrast, when the legislature brings forward a ballot question, their bill doesn't go through the title board. They get to write it all by themselves. They write it as deceptively as they like to con voters to vote for it. This is why voters were suckered into repealing Gallagher. The Gallagher repeals first sentence said, quote, without raising property taxes, end quote, the key wording being rates. Voters innocently thought that meant it wouldn't raise property taxes, but it was said without raising property tax rates. You see, when your property values go skyrocketing, as they did in the last few years, and your property tax rate stays the same, your property tax doesn't stay the same. It also skyrockets. I'm oversimplifying here, but Gallagher used to lower the property tax rate of your residential property to make sure that total property tax was basically the same as the year before, even if your property value went skyrocketing. Pretty cool. No wonder the legislature hated it. The lying ballot title then went on to say how repealing it would, without raising tax rates, fix education, first responders, fire departments, and give orphans unicorns. In the same way, this falls HH, also written by the legislature, lies. Its first line says, shall the state reduce property taxes? You had me at hello. Whether or not HH passes, you are going to have the largest property taxes increase in Colorado history, period. You're paying the price for repealing Gallagher. Should HH pass, your property tax will just be a tiny bit less than otherwise. Kinda. But in exchange, you will over time lose your Tabor refunds forever. No Tabor refund checks for you, your kids, their kids, and so on. HH's ballot title doesn't mention that it's itsy bitsy, teeny weeny property tax reduction comes out of your Tabor refunds. It only says it's paid for by, quote, using a portion of the state surplus. The lying legislature doesn't even mention in its ballot title that those state surplus would have gone back to you anyway. Wow. Now you can read the rest of John Caldera's article here, but he hits the nail on the head that Proposition HH is a deceptive piece of legislation designed to eliminate the Taxpayer Bill of Rights to steal more of our money. So shame on the legislature. Please oppose Proposition HH in November. And let's move on. Aurora Police arrest man who allegedly shot and killed teen who tried to steal car. Now, the reason I bring this up is because we've seen these instances happen before here in Colorado and across the country. It's very unfortunate that crime is increasing. Crime seems to be out of control in some parts of the Denver metro area. And the police don't seem to be responding um, properly, in a lot of people's opinion, to this increased crime. So what are people doing? Well, individuals are taking this responsibility to defend themselves and their communities into their own hands. So it's unfortunate, but I think we're going to see more of these types of situations. Police arrested Orist Schurer, 27, on charges of first-degree murder, an attempted first-degree murder after he allegedly fatally shot a teen boy trying to steal his car. Police arrested an Aurora man after he allegedly shot two teenagers, killing one of them Wednesday after he suspected they were attempting to break into his car, according to Aurora police. Wow. The shooting happened around 11.20 p.m. Wednesday in the 19400 block of East 59th Place, just east of the Rocky Mountain Arsenal National Wildlife Refuge. Area residents heard a car alarm and saw two people dressed in all black trying to break into a Hyundai Elantra. The vehicle's owner confronted them and the two teens sped away in another suspected stolen vehicle, according to the release. He then got into his Hyundai, armed, and followed the other vehicle, allegedly firing several shots hitting both of them until it crashed a short ways away. One of the teens was rushed to the hospital where he died of his wounds, according to the release. He has not been positively identified, but is believed to be a teenage boy. The second teen, 13, who was also wounded, ran to a nearby relative's house and self-transported to a hospital. He is expected to survive. So very interesting to see that this is happening. It is unfortunate, but you know, if 
the police aren't going to protect people in their community, then I think you're going to see more individuals kind of taking that responsibility on themselves for better or for worse, like in this case. Let's move on. This is from Axios Denver, John Frank, July 5th, 2023. Why Colorado is a hotspot for third political parties. If you're not aware, Colorado has some great ballot access laws, which allows third parties uh, and independent p- individuals to run for office to get on the ballot a lot easier than in most other states across our, our across our country. So Colorado is really great for ballot access. Colorado's independent ethos and unaffiliated voter bloc are making it a hotbed for new political parties that are seeking to upset the two-party system. So, of course, there's the forward party, which has been around there. Um, there's different parties, of course, out there all across the state, the no labels party, the six minor party. So kind of interesting to see how that is going on. But what's really interesting is how Colorado allows, um, which the article doesn't go into, unfortunately, but Colorado really does allow uh, a lot easier ballot access and allows individuals to get on the ballot compared to other states, as I mentioned. So very interesting to see that Colorado is kind of a hotbed for some of these new political organizations that are now attempting to um, be influential in the in the future political scene. So we will see how that plays out going into 2024. Now checking out denvergazette.com, unexplained or serious deaths pile up among residents of Colorado's growing assisted living industry. From July 7th, 2023, four-month investigation reveals preventable deaths happen more often than the public knows. Now this is absolutely tragic. Of course, you know, some of the biggest victims of the COVID catastrophe were in uh, assisted living facilities. And it's a horrible, horrible, tragic situation that we've seen over the last three plus years because of that. But it's also very unfortunate to see how this situation is not necessarily been solved in some of these different organizations, some of these different places where you might have somebody in your family don't necessarily do their best to take care of them. I think this is a symptom of the breakup of the family unit that we're unfortunately seeing across our country over the last several decades and an inability of individuals to to take care of their own, to really look out for each other. And this breakdown of civil society is leading to some really tragic situations. So this article does go into some of the very sad and tragic and even gruesome Deaths, as it says here, but uh, what's interesting is the bigger trend. A four-month Denver Gazette investigation into Colorado's burgeoning assisted living industry revealed that preventable deaths at facilities promising a watchful eye happen more often than the public knows. There were 110 documented deaths classified by the state as unexplained or suspicious at assisted living facilities between January 1st, 2018 and October 28th, 2020. According to Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment records obtained and analyzed by the Gazette, the records come from mandatory self-reporting by facilities. But the Gazette analysis of more than 4,500 reports plus independent reporting also discovered three dozen more deaths or incidents of neglect and abuse that later led to death. In some of those cases, the deaths were found within state records classified as something other than death. In at least one other, a facility never reported a death at all. So they they say three dozen here, so 36 out of 110. I mean, that's a massive increase, right? A lot more um, than what the government is reporting is happening. And it's really, really unfortunate. Wow. The series of preventable deaths across the state included a resident who died after not getting medication for days. Another with an untreated wound that led to fatal sepsis. And yet another left it un- unattended outside for six hours in 100 degree heat that slowly baked her to death. So people, family is very important. Take care of your family. And, you know, maybe this is a wake up call to a lot of people who have older family members who are thinking about putting them in these situations. And, you know, maybe it's not the best idea. So very interesting, especially with Colorado's aging population, to see this trend continue over years. Something to keep an eye on for sure. Let's move on. Getting back to last uh, week when we talked about the 303 creative case that the Supreme Court decided in favor of a Colorado web designer, this article from the Federalist Society kind of plays into some of that uh, outcome and kind of explains it from an originalist understanding of the First Amendment. I thought this was extremely fascinating. This is from July 3rd, 2023. With an originalist understanding of the First Amendment, the 303 creative case would have been much easier. On, its, on the last day of its recent term, the Supreme Court decided 303 Creative versus Alanis 
In my view, the court's disposition was correct, but it was rendered more difficult by confusion over how the Constitution's First Amendment uses the terms, quote, the freedom of speech and the freedom of the press. As explained below, 303 Creative should have been treated as a press case, not as a speech case. If it had been so treated, the discussion of 303's creative's commercial nature would have been unnecessary. So it goes into the background here. And then there's the commercial problem. So much of the dispute in 303 Creative centered on the commercial nature of Mr. Mrs. Smith's activity. The state argued, as paraphrased by Justice Gorsuch, quote, this case involves only the sale of an ordinary commercial product and any burden on Mrs. Smith's speech is purely incidental. Similarly, Justice Sonia Sotomayor's dissent emphasized 303 Creative's commercial nature. She, dis she distinguished earlier rulings in favor of free speech by noting that the prior cases involved the rights of nonprofit expressive associations. However, the court held that the commercial nature of the firm was not dispositive because, quote, Ms. Smith does not seek to sell an ordinary commercial good, but intends to create customized and tailored speech for each couple. So very, very interesting to see how what freedom of the press um, protects communication. Traditionally, that's the original idea of the First Amendment. The medium doesn't matter. Newspaper op-ed could be a leaflet, a book, or a pamphlet. That is press. You know, that is press freedom is publishing something. So very interesting to see how this plays out in this case. Read that article if you're interested. Of course, these links can all be found at freestatecolorado.com. Staying on this same case, I want to look at the last article of the week from Ari Armstrong from Complete Colorado, page 2. SCOTUS rightly recognizes the right not to speak. The right to speak freely entails the right not to speak. If someone forces you to express some message of which you disprove, that person has violated your right to freedom of speech and to freedom of conscience more broadly. The Supreme Court was right, therefore, to protect the ability of business owners to decline to create products expressing views with which they agree. And that is the issue at the heart of the 303 creative decision. Critics of the decision, in effect, argue that people may be forced to speak as a condition of running a business. If someone from a marginalized group protected by anti-discrimination laws orders a product expressing some message contrary to the business owner's beliefs, usually at issues are cakes or websites or the like for gay marriages, which some religious conservatives continue to oppose. Gallup found that only 41% of weekly churchgoers, quote, say gay marriages should be legally recognized. Wow. While 71% of the general population do. In such cases, critics say a business owner should not be able to decline to express the message unless they go out of business. The ACLU, for example, which traditionally has been a major champion of free speech, in this case argues that some speech may be legally mandated for the sake of limiting discrimination. The ACLU says in a release, quote, the Supreme Court held that a business offering customized expressive services has the right to violate state laws prohibiting such businesses from discrimination in sales. The court's decision opens the door to any business that claims to provide customized services to discriminate against historically marginalized groups. The decision is fundamentally misguided. Wow. How far the ACLU has fallen and how unfortunate. Uh, Armstrong in this article talks about what Phil Weiser says, which we did talk about last week. Of course, Representative Titone. What's interesting is uh, the misinterpretation of the decision, as Armstrong explains here. <clears throat> the ruling does not, as Titone says, generally allow businesses to deny service based on gender, race, religion, or who they love. Nor does the ruling allow a business generally to refuse to serve interracial couples, women-owned businesses, or Mormons, as Weiser claims in his release. Rather, the decision pertains only to products created to order that express some message. That's a small fraction of business services. Consider the difference. Let's say some bigoted jerk disproved of interracial marriage. Believe it or not, there's still few people like that. Under the ruling, if an interracial couple went to a bakery to buy an off-the-shelf cake, the business owner could not legally decline to sell them the cake. But if the couple ordered a cake specifically to explicitly celebrate an interracial marriage, the cake baker could refuse the order on First Amendment grounds. So very, very interesting. Um, as Ari Armstrong explains, people have rights, no matter how um, distasteful it may be. But you know you have a right to make your own decisions in your life. And it's good that the Supreme Court recognizes that. 
Well, thank you very much for joining me this week. It's been a great uh, 4th of July week, Independence Day, so wonderful to celebrate. Hope you got to spend some time with your family and friends. But we'll see you next week with some more articles and news stories and the next part in our property tech series with Natalie Menning. So thank you very much and take care.